Hello, we're going to go over drug misuse, misuse and abuse this week. I'm going to give a quick overview of some of the things for you to go over in the module this week. Um, I'm also going to give you some hints inside this uh, PowerPoint for you to focus in on in your book and make sure you read and do the homework. Pay attention also to some of the things I'm going to be highlighting. So big thing to start is that um, there are basically a few areas I'm going to cover today. Uh, drug dynamics, how are they working in your brain? How do drugs impact your brain and, and affect it? Um, affect the, what they call the reward center where they block um, the uptake of some, certain neurotransmitters. We're going to go over the types of drugs that are out there um, from prescription drugs, over-the-counter, recreational, illicit. And then also I want to make sure that you know the different types of drugs when it uh, comes to um, uh, categories, stimulants, cannabis, narcotics, depressants. This is all on page 368 in your book. Then we're also going to talk about some common drugs of abuse, treating and reducing drug abuse, and then of course the drug abuse misuse in the United States. We have an opiate epidemic, and here in Kern County, we have a real high use of meth. It really does impact our, our community. So first, let's start off by how drugs affect the brain. And right here, I'm on um, the very beginning of your chapter on um, 359. Uh, I'm on chapter 13, avoiding drug misuse and abuse. It might be chapter 12 in an older edition. But this is really taking a look at how it impacts the brain. And what people don't quite understand and is that as they're taking and consuming the drug, it's actually either doing two things. It's either blocking the uptake of a neurotransmitter. And if you look on page 360, it does a little graph, and I'm going to show you this pretty soon. Or it mimics one. And it can have an antagonistic where it's blocking, or it can stimulate it. So look to see how the drug is interacting. Each one is a little bit different. A neurotransmitter, and you're going to hear me talk about this. You probably heard of, of this in biology or in the past. A neurotransmitter is a chemical substance. It's actually a chemical substance that is released. And what it does is it actually will cross the synapses in your brain, you know, uh, the dendrites and the synapses, synapses, and it'll go across and it'll chemically react and then it will send a nerve impulse. So I really like um, this picture right here and then I'll go back to the other slide. So this is the action of cocaine. And so let's just look at cocaine. And one of the big things is that dopamine, you'll hear about dopamine, this is a neurotransmitter that really gives a sensation of reward. And in some ways, this is more powerful than all the other neurotransmitters, such as um, serotonin and, um, you know, uh, you'll hear of epinephrine and different ones that are out there. But dopamine is one of those that gives you this feeling of anticipation of reward. It also gets you focused and it's a, it's one that helps us move through life. So in your brain, there's the reward center. And if you look over on the left side here of the PowerPoint, you'll see the reward center is at the base of the brain. It's the most primal part of our brain at the very base of our central nervous system. And what happens is when it, cocaine gets in, in, ingested, inhaled, um, it goes into the system and it, you'll see the cocaine and here it is not blocking, and you'll see the dopamine getting released. And then what happens is the body reuptakes it again so that it, it goes into our system and then it gets reuptake, it, it gets reabsorbed. What cocaine does is it actually blocks the reuptake. Do you see that right there? And it keeps dopamine in our system. So what it does is cocaine will give us that reward sensation over and over and over again. What that does is it makes us feel like we can conquer the world. Cocaine's very addictive. 
Um, it's very physically addictive and it's considered a stimulant. So it makes people feel, um, have a lot of energy and, and, and feel like they can do anything. But the reality is, is that once we start pushing all this dopamine into our system, our body will start to get imbalanced and start to not function and start looking for the cocaine um, in the future. We'll be thinking, well, I don't really need to pr produce this dopamine anymore because we've got enough in the system. Cocaine then isn't in the system anymore. And then you could see this person having really low dopamine levels and needing and craving that cocaine to block it, to put the dopamine levels back in. So this, this actually mis mixes in with our chemistry and it impacts the chemistry within our brain. One of the things you need to know that um, there are many different types of drugs and there's a lot of different drug use uh, across areas from alcohol to tobacco to marijuana. And the most prevalent one, the one that we see the most of is alcohol. And you just finished a chapter on alcohol and a lot of people don't realize that alcohol is very much a drug. Um, you know, it has ethanol in it and it blocks the uptake of GABA and GABA makes us feel really relaxed. So every single drug does something to our brain um, that alters the chemistry. And when, when I say drugs and I say psychoactive drug, that means it's actually changing something in our brain. It is changing and altering our state. So one of the big things is that um, drug prevention and chemistry and um, how our, bra our brains are developing, when drugs are introduced into our brain early on, it starts to affect our chemistry and start to alter our chemistry. And um, it's really interesting because um, also during this time, if we go back to this reward center, 25 year olds and under uh, adolescents to 25 are really in still developing their brain functions. And they're also still developing their prefrontal cortex, that front part of your brain right here. And they're, they're more into high risk behavior. So typically we find that drug use really is um, prevalent more, you'll see higher rates of it in younger populations. But the reality is that the brain chemistry is still being developed. And when people start to introduce chemistry, the drugs into their system at an early age, they actually can affect themselves for the rest and, and affect their brain for the rest of their life really impede brain development. So um, that's something to keep in mind. And if you research this, um, you'll see it's, it's, a, it's a paradox that people use drugs when they're earlier, but they're also using it when their brain is most susceptible. And that's something I'm gonna really talk about right now is this prefrontal cortex, this red part of your brain. Um, this part of the brain doesn't completely mature until 25 years of age. So this part of the brain is constantly um, in development and still maturing, and it's the one that does the higher level thinking. What's interesting about all these drugs, especially um, the majority of these drugs, like alcohol, marijuana, um, this, the ones that are central nervous depressant ones, they'll actually bring our cognitive levels down and lower our IQ levels which again is paradoxical because we have a lot of people going to school. And so that same high risk age group is consuming drugs, but then at the same time, they're trying to develop their prefrontal cortex the, at the most, um, at a really key point in their life. So um, I have to tell you that when I go out and I research drugs um, in the use, it's interesting that United States, we have, um, a uh, 15% use of cannabis uh, for 30 days in the United States. France has 17%. Um, so it looks like France is cons consuming more. But then if you go out to the average uh, European out there, it's less than 2%. So, um, but I find this statistic kind of um, daunting that on average, 35% of US students used an illicit drug in their lifetime. So it's one out of every three students have used an illicit drug. 
And then what the problem is in this next slide right here is showing drug use. And this is deaths from over drug use that have jumped up in nearly every country across the United States from 2003 to 2014. And this is um, opiate. So this is painkillers and heroin. So right now we have an opiate um, crisis, they're calling it. A crisis in a sense that people are consuming opiates and often they're combining it with other types of drugs like alcohol. And then their respiratory system and their brain and their everything, well, respiratory and their heart start to slow down and then they stop working. So we have to understand that right now we do have um, drug problems and we have an increase in them across the United States, especially in opiates. And here in Kern County, it's meth. So I'll be talking about that. So what I want you to look at now is in your book, take a look at, um, so in your book, take a look at um, the different classifications. And I actually have to say categories. That would be better. So I'm going to say stress that. It's on page um, 368. Um, and th these drugs are in categories of stimulus, cannabis, narcotics, depressants, hallucinogenics, um, inhalants, and then anabolic steroids. And on this page, and this is going to be a test question for your, um, in your quiz, on this page you're going to see the category and then the drug. So, for example, under stimulants, can you think of what goes under stimulants right now? Cocaine, um, meth. Cannabis would be what? Marijuana and hashish. Narcotics, what would that be? Heroin, morphine. Um, you've probably heard of um, oxyto, uh, oxyco, uh, oxycodone or codeine. Um, and then under depressants, we have um, gamma, benz, uh, benzodiazepines, other depressants. And then we have hallucinogenics such as um, MDMA. LSD, and then inhalants, and then anabolics, uh, steroids, which are testosterone. So each one of these um, are often um, abused. And what I really like is that there's more of these out there. And if you go to drugabuse.gov drugs, and this is actually in your module, you'll see all the different drug classifications, um, cat categories out there, and then uh, the drugs that are being watched and, and, and they're grouped, okay? So take a look at those. So I'm going to show you different types of drugs, and let's see if we can talk about them real briefly. So stimulants, um, amphetamines, are all called also called binnies, dex, meth, speed, crosstops, uppers, and ice. Um, and you probably heard of these, like for Ritalin, that's used for medical purposes. So you know both of these have. Um, it has, it's, a, it's a drug that is, but has a medical use, but also can be, often has a, it can be abused and misused. Uh, meth in our county is one of the most powerful drugs. And I'm going to show you some slides uh, that will show how people can just change and transform. One of the things is it makes people just stay completely up all night. Um, and... Um, and they can easily be made from over-the-counter drugs. So that's the reason why when you go to the pharmacist, they ask for your ID um, when you're getting Sudafed because that's one of the components for meth. And so they're tracking people and who's purchasing Sudafed. If they're buying big amounts of it, then expect a DEA person knocking on someone's door if they get a whole bunch of Sudafed. Caffeine is very popular. And it's also a psychoactive drug. Um, it's a mild central nervous system depressant. That's what CNS stands for. And, um, and it, takes, it stays in the body from four to six hours. So that's really kind of important for those people um, who are thinking, why aren't I sleeping? Even if you had caffeine um, later, like after around dinner time, you might not feel the effects of it, but it's still in your body and it does impact on sleep. So these are different caffeine contents, and I have to say it always kind of blows my mind. So those Starbucks, that's 260 milligrams. Yep, that's my Starbucks up there. And then um, all the way down to the Coca-Cola, which has 29 milligrams. These energy drinks only have 77 milligrams. But again, pounding these um, is not a good idea. 
So there you go. That gives you an idea of what's out there. Hallucinogenics are things that actually alter the brain. And this is when you can, a person can actually um, see and see visions of different things and hear and see things that aren't there. So uh, synesthesia, this is the idea where you can, uh, when you see something and you can taste it or you can hear and then taste. So things are getting crossed in the brain. It alters perception. And hallucinogenics are, you know, LSD and um, things along those nature. Um, we've got mushrooms. And then um, a very powerful one is um, PCP, which actually used to be an anesthetic, but it was now uh, used medically, but now it's not. It's taken off. It's very rarely used because people, when they get on it, they get um, aggressive. And I remember hearing a story about how someone got on, they used to use PCP in the very beginning. And then um, what happened was the patients became violent. So they stopped using it. Um, so you, you'll see that LSD is, uh, you can see it broken down. And then it talks about how it stays in the system and raises up the blood pressure and how it takes people into like another experience. They'll say they're tripping. Meth, this is something right here from here um, in our county. And that it is, when you look at the studies, almost uh, they did a study of emergency, emergency room visits and law enforcement. And, and one out of every three um, incidents in Kern County had a, somehow was related to meth. So it's really taxing our system as a society. Another one you probably don't hear much about but it's out there, is that they're doing things where they're chemically altering things and they're creating synthetic drugs. Spice is one of those. It falls into this interesting category that you don't see listed here on page 368, which are designer drugs. These are drugs that are, um, believe it or not, illegal, not illegal unless there's an ordinance, but people make up and chemically alter things. Um, and people's reaction to, to synthetic marijuana or fake weed can go from anywhere where they're, um, you know, hyper and all over the place and seeing visions to passing out and going into a coma. So, because uh, there's everything and anything in them. Bath salts. This is another one that's out there. Um, and this would fall into the stimulants. And yes, it it's, could be legal and you can find it in convenience stores. Um, but stronger than meth, ecstasy, and cocaine combined. Yeah, very powerful. And people inhale these, and they can actually stop breathing. Amazing. Um, yeah, I talked before about this meth. 39% of all prosecutions in Kern County included meth offenses. 37% of emergency room patients have used meth. 50% of substance abuse treatment emissions are from meth. And one third of the adult probation cases and nearly 17% of juvenile probation cases involve meth. Yes, we have a meth problem. It's serious. This is what meth does. It alters people. This is just 1.5 years difference. Look at the woman on the right to the left. This, this happens because they stop eating, they stop sleeping, they stop living. And meth, if you, when you watch the videos on, on NIH, I posted some of the videos. Meth does something really interesting to the brain. It blocks the up uptake of dopamine, but also stimulates the body to put more dopamine in. It does two things. And what that does is it just really revs people up unbelievably. So, um, so the next question, and I'm going to jump now to the next item. Um, what do you think is more carcinogenic, causes cancer, marijuana or tobacco? And I'm going to tell you that both, both, are, um, both are carcinogenic. People can argue each way, but the fact is that marijuana does put um, carcinogens into the body and it does impact on the respiratory system. You could debate it, but it, goes, it is definitely carcinogenic. So the active ingredient is THC, and it's a psychoactive substance, so it means it changes the chemistry in the brain. And uh, I have a really good video that I posted in the module that I'd like you to take a look at. 
and it talk, actually talks about how marijuana um, inhibits and blocks uh, and mi mimics a, a cannabinoid in the brain. So it actually mimics a neurotransmitter and it tricks your body into thinking it's a different neurotransmitter. So it's, a, it's an interesting one. It's, it's a mimic. And it, um, it can be addictive. But what marijuana does is that it actually lowers, um, lowers IQ by 10 points. And it's interesting that um, I said it can be addictive that because the brain is changing and chemically um, developing. And so for teenagers, they're very susceptible to it. One in 16, 16s can become addicted to marijuana. So you have to understand that kids are at greater risk for this than adults. And so you have to understand that if a teen starts to, to, to really smoke marijuana, an intervention really is needed. I know people are like, oh, it's legal, it's da da da. It changes the chemistry. Watch the video. For a teen, that's especially important because their prefrontal cortex is not developed yet. So this can totally impede the development of their brain. It can impede their higher functioning and thinking and it can affect their ability to remember things and to learn things and so for a teen in their life stage they're at that point when they have to do well in high school and they have to choose a job that's different for a 50 or 60 year old they've already whatever they've done in life they've learned it but for a teen it's key so i can't emphasize it enough i hope you feel me um this is interesting Dependencies or abuse of specific illicit drugs for persons 12 or older. Look at the marijuana use. They're gravitating towards marijuana. And then this is just, cup. Of, put, these are articles. And what they did is they took all the different articles and they grouped them and in, in how they, they clustered up. So this is that data all pushed together. And you'll see that marijuana is the highest. Next is pain relievers. Next is cocaine. Tranquilers tranquilizers, hallucinogenics, and then you can see it drop. But these pain relievers, it's interesting, those are opiates and heroin. Um, you know, I feel like heroin could drop into the pain relievers, but you get the idea. You also need to know that THC has completely changed in a sense that it's gotten much more stronger. So the THC of 1960 that's in marijuana is five times stronger than it is now. So when people smoke marijuana now, they're getting much higher levels doses of the psychoactive, psychoactive agent that actually inhibits the brain. So this is look at the levels. This is the psychoactive ingredient of THC. And then you can see an increase over time. So in 2011, you can see it. I think this is probably my favorite slide for making a point. So for heavy users, and especially among adolescents, their IT, uh, IQ points drop by six to eight points. They actually lose their IQ. So, and this is interesting too, youth with poor academic results are, are more than four times likely to have used marijuana. So when you take a, a students that are really low performing and you ask them if they've used marijuana, they're four times more likely to have used marijuana. And I can tell you that I've seen students who have actively gotten off marijuana and I've watched their grades go up. I've seen it at, even at BC when students said, I'm gonna stop smoking because I need to concentrate in your class. I'm telling you, it lowers the IQ. So this is gonna be on your quiz. What type of drug is it? I want you to name what, uh, what the drug falls under as far as a category. So I'm gonna ask you to choose one drug uh, you know, cocaine, meth, marijuana, heroin, um, one of the uh, illicit drugs, and I want you to tell me what did it, what type uh, category it falls in. So if it's cocaine, you're going to put down that it's a stimulant. And then you're going to tell me what the adverse effects of the drug are. How does it impact the brain? And if you go back to the slide, if you actually go to page um, 360, you'll see how it adversely impacts the, the brain, how it blocks the uptake of dopamine. So it keeps dopamine in there. Typically how it's ingested, um, it's, um, it's inhaled. 
Um, it's smoked. I mean, actually, yeah. So it's, it's snorted, it's injected, and it's smoked. And it's also orally. And, and you can look at page 368. And then what you need to know about this drug and why we need to remember it. Um, we need to remember um, cocaine because it actually impedes the uptake of, of dopamine. It pushes too much dopamine into our system. And then it's highly physically addictive. So once someone stops um, taking cocaine, their body doesn't know how um, to process the dopamine. They actually will feel like they need to take it in order to feel any type of pleasure. And that's something that people talk about when they get addicted to drugs. And you'll see this with drug addicts, they'll say this, and, and everyone will tell you this, that that high, they never can get that high again. They never, and sometimes their affect will actually change because they can't feel the joy and the, the day of life that, that the natural dopamine levels aren't there. And that crave for cocaine, to push that cocaine in the body, to get that dopamine level back, the body has become dependent on it. it. Yes, people can get off of it, but it impacts, their, impacts them over time. And then um, it talks about withdrawal symptoms. And one of those big things is apathy. Um, long periods of sleep. The body just doesn't feel like moving anymore. So that's why we need to remember it because getting on cocaine alters our ability to function. So then I also want you to understand drug misuse and abuse. So drug misuse is basically using a drug for an, a purpose other than what it was intended for. So let's say I was um, prescribed um, Vicodin. Okay, what's a um, and it's a that's a benzoid, uh, diazepam, and I, it's for anti anxiety, and I have a friend who's anxious, and I say, hey, take one of my Vicodins. I mean, actually, that's an opiate. I used a bad example. So, um, um, so Vicodin is an uh, is an actual opiate, and so I say, hey, take one of my painkillers, and then um, and then they take the painkiller, but they're not prescribed it. That's misuse. Or um, I um, decide to self-treat myself with, um, after I got painkillers, after um, I got a root canal, and then I decide to treat myself um, for back pain. Um, instead of going to the doctor and getting the back pain diagnosed, I'm taking a painkiller to treat it. That is misuse. Drug abuse is the excessive use of any drug that will cause any harm. And it becomes very compulsive. And a person will not, uh, will not function unless they have that drug. And that's when it starts to become abuse. So do you know the difference between misuse and abuse? Can you give examples of drug misuse? So um, the next one I'm going to talk about is Vicodin. Um, Painkillers, I meant. And I used that example before about Vicodin. But there, right now we have an opiate um, problem and opiates are um they fall into narcotics you'll hear the narcotics and opiates they're used interchangeably and so it's like morphine um um hydro uh, codeine uh oxycodone uh codeine heroin all those and uh, vicodin is a perfect example falls into that and it gets over prescribed and doctors feel really pressured so um there's no video linked here, but you could just go out and you can see that um, there's an, actually I can post it on the module if you'd like to see it, that's easy to do. And you could take a look at this and see how people are over prescribing Vicodin and opiates. And this is leading to an addiction. And that slide that I showed before about nar narcotics and, uh, and the addiction is becoming prevalent. Next thing I'm going to move on to is evidence-based approaches to drug addiction treatment. You have to know that um, not all drug treatment is the same. And, there, and we have to follow evidence-based strategies that really work. And so this means using everything from um, giving um, an alcoholic anti-abuse so that when they, they consume alcohol, they'll violently throw up and never want to, to drink it. But then they're also in behavioral therapy. And they're doing group therapy. And they're doing all these different things and it's evidence-based. It's been proven to work. Sometimes people do drug treatment and it's not evidence-based. They'll discuss, they'll talk about drugs, 
but they won't be doing a whole comprehensive approach. So all drug addiction treatment is not equal. That's what I wanted to put out there. Um, I have to tell you that right now, um, a lot of Americans are needing treatment for a drug or alcohol problem. I remember a statistic in my drugs, health, and society class, seven out of 10 um, workers are affected by some type of drug. And so there are steps to recovery. And um, sometimes these people are, fit, are physically addicted to drugs and they need help to wean themselves off the drug. And they also need to have psychological support because people can become both physically and psychologically addicted to a drug. So what's interesting is that when people get removed from the drug detoxification, often the withdrawal are the opposite of whatever they were, uh, of what the drug was doing. So for example, alcohol is a central nervous depressant. When you remove alcohol, they start to get shaky and tremors because the alcohol is not there anymore to help depress the central nervous system. So they'll start to get these anxiety and shaky tremors. So it's the opposite, it doesn't depress the central nervous system. Cocaine is a stimulant, for example. People stop taking cocaine, what do they do all day? They're apathetic and they're sleeping. So it does the exact opposite office of what usually the drug does for people. And that makes sense because when you take a drug away, the body doesn't have that anything to help stabilize it anymore. And it does, it, it just feels this void. Um, there are different types of out behavioral treatment and there's residential treatment, which by the way, we have very limited treatment facilities in our community, but maybe one day that'll change. There's 12 set programs and um, where they move people through um, steps of, um, that are more along psychological. So the one part is physical and the other part is psychological. So that is the end of my PowerPoint. And what I wanna show you now is that um, if you go, um, okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and move to um, the module. Share screen, okay. And I'm gonna show you now that you can watch this module on NIH videos on Reward Center. You need to watch that, it's very important. The sign is of addiction. Um, I also put um, drug abuse charts down here and I, I'm gonna go ahead and drag that up. Um, drug awareness, this is a good drug awareness page and um, and I definitely want to put down um, the, put, I'm gonna put down the crack, I'm gonna publish this one right here. This is the government crackdown on painkillers. So take a look at all of these and take your drug and misuse. Um, and it's not really chapter 12, it's actually chapter 12 and chapter 13. So I'm just gonna remove that so it doesn't confuse you. And then, um, and then your quiz will open. Now your quiz is gonna be on um, the promoting and preserving psychological health. So those were those chapters uh, grouped together. I think two, three, and four might be a little bit different in another edition. Co uh, ch chapters covering managing stress and coping. Chapters covering avoiding drug use and misuse. And then of course our alcohol chapter. You will have one hour and two attempts. I have an essay question here, which I've already told you in this module. So if you were listening, you will be ready for that essay question, okay? If you have any questions, I'm gonna have virtual hours, like I always do at seven o'clock. I probably won't do a Zoom, but I'll be available for chat, okay? And you can definitely chat back and forth. See this chat feature, we can use that. Um, we can also use Zoom if it's easy for that to do too. So I look forward to any of your questions and I hope you have a great week.